Welcome to Schweitzer Drive, a podcast where we explore what goes on between the generation of electricity and the light switch. Join Dave Whitehead as he interviews the entrepreneurs, innovators, and experts who are inventing the future of electric power. Hi, I'm Dave Whitehead, and welcome to Schweitzer Drive. In this episode, we're going to talk about one of the oldest sources of renewable energy, hydroelectric power. It's accountable for about a third of the U.S. renewable electricity generation, and unlike wind and solar, it can provide a steady flow of power 24-7. Yet, so much of this discussion related to hydropower focuses on its challenges. This is why I'm excited to talk to today's guest, Gia Schneider, CEO of Natel Energy. The team at Natel is doing some innovative work that is reducing the environmental impact of hydropower while making it simpler and more cost-effective. Gia co-founded Natel Energy with her brother Abe Schneider in 2009. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from MIT and has 20 years of experience in the energy industry. Prior to Natel, Gia worked at Accenture where she provided strategic solutions around asset management to major energy companies and at Constellation Energy where she optimized generation asset value. She left Constellation in 2004 to help start the energy trading desk at Credit Suisse, and in 2005, she started the carbon emission trading desk there, growing it to a profitable business in its first year. It's nice to have you here, and this topic is really interesting, so I can't wait to get into it. Awesome. Well, thanks very much. I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to share a little bit more about hydropower with you and your audience. Will you talk about the history of Natel Energy and where your passion for hydropower came from? Absolutely. Um, the story underlying why uh, my brother and I co-founded Natel really goes back to actually our childhood. So we grew up with a father who was very interested in energy and climate change, uh, even in the 80s. Um, and as a result, we very early on had this awareness that climate change was an issue that of concern and that in order to address climate change, we fundamentally needed to transform our energy infrastructure. And then hydro came into being because water is a really important part of just both my brothers and I personal um, recreational lives. Like he's an avid fisherman. We both spend a lot of time surfing and kiting. We both spend a lot of time on the water. And uh, and as such, it just uh, was ingrained in us to think about how um, we might be able to find ways to make hydropower, which is you know, the oldest source of renewable energy, find ways to make hydropower more sustainable um, as we think about this transition for the future. What what were your initial thoughts on the sustainability? I, I could probably make an argument out of out of all our energy sources, hydro is the greenest, right? It is. I, I make an argument is probably the best battery I can think of in the the world to put a bunch of water behind a dam. And man, you've got a twenty four seven as we talked about earlier in the podcast uh, a source. So, what was the thought process of making it even more efficient, more greener, more sustainable? Yeah, it it really comes down to the fact that. Um, as with all development, when we build hydro, we're obviously putting things into a river system that weren't there before. And in the past, the ap approaches in hydro, actually, if you rewind, say, 100 years ago, started out in a more distributed fashion. Um, but over the decades, transitioned to some of the very large mega projects that we saw, particularly from, say, the 1960s through the early 80s. And those big projects with massive dams um, and uh, and and just they, they cause a lot of disruption in in, in the river flow and uh, and so uh, that combined with the fact that unfortunately the turbines that spin that actually produce the electricity in those dams are also while very high performance machines super efficient machines um, are not necessarily ones that that fish or <laughs> that animals can go through easily um, presents a challenge. And so that was the core for us was like, is there a way for us to rethink or reimagine hydro um, and keep the amazing, um, reliable, renewable energy aspects while improving some of those biodiversity elements? Because um, sustainability is really a, a, you know, sustainability comes about as a, as a combination of multiple things. Um, and so I think our focus here was, can we improve the biodiversity? diversity side of hydro. Yeah, that's really cool. 
You and your team at Intel are working on some innovative technology related to improving the, the outlook for hydropower. And and as you mentioned, let, let, let's pull that thread where we start talking about the fish safe turbine. Can you tell us a little bit about the the idea behind that and, and the technology? What what differentiates it between the say the, the big turbines we were just talking about with the uh, say large large inside large large dams? Yeah, um, absolutely. So I think our focus and, and it was starting from the big picture, we looked at the space for hydro and really you can characterize hydropower um, in two ways. One is that we have a large existing fleet um, in places like the United States, Europe, Japan, et cetera, where um, that existing fleet is also old. You know, these are projects that were built in many cases, 50, 60 years ago. The average age of the fleet in the United States is like 65 years old. In Europe, it's 55 years And so we have this large existing installed base where we have old equipment that needs to be replaced anyway. And the idea was, can we, for that large existing fleet, can we design turbines in a different way that they can go into those existing plants, but have a dramatically different fish passage profile while continuing to produce the same electricity or perhaps even more electricity given that we have a new modern and uh, efficient blade. That was that's kind of one element. And then the second element was uh, for hydro is can we unlock new builds? So can we unlock new hydropower projects that probably won't look like some of those same massive um, style projects of the past? And for there, we see it partic- as being particularly relevant to more of um, some parts of the world where we're building new hydro, such as countries, a number of countries in Africa, a number of countries in Southeast Asia, um, and in South America, where there's a lot of resource remaining to be developed, a lot of new potential that we can bring online. So our view is how do we do both of those things? And, um, the key for us really starts with the turbine design because, uh, well, because fundamentally the form factor of what a hydropower plant physically looks like is very tied to the choice of turbine. And so the turbine design um, and the characteristics, like how much water flow, how variable the flow can be, how high the um, dam it you know needs to be or should be to have an optimal power performance, all of those things are tied up in the design of the turbine itself. And our um, kind of aha moment was that uh, with with enormous respect to you know, decades of engineering excellence in the hydropower industry uh, with tremendous, like enormously smart, you know, some best engineers in the world um, from a hydraulic design perspective. Um, up and what we realized was that the industry had been optimizing just for efficiency um, in the design of turbines. And what we decided was that if we put an additional constraint of optimizing for fish passage and efficiency, that it was actually possible to create a design solution in a very novel shape to the turbine blade. And that then um, is the core of what we've created. So just to describe the blade, um, what we realized is that a combination of two things, a very, very blunt or very thick leading edge, um, which in the blade effectively creates, as the blade moves to the water, a very thick leading edge basically creates what's called a stagnation zone in front of that blade. You can think of it almost as a pressure field that deflects things around the blade. Um, and so that way it reduces a direct strike. And direct strike is a very um, negative or injurious thing um, for for fish or other animals going through. So being able to deflect things around the blade is enabled by a very thick leading edge. And we combine that with a swoop of the blade forward um, as you go from hub to tip. And that is an important part of the design because that is how we maintain consistently high survival rates from hub to tip. And intuitively, the math or the physics that that we're dealing with there is if you were on a merry-go-round and you stood at the center, you wouldn't feel like you're moving that fast. But if you were out at the edge of the outer edge of the merry-go-round, you feel like you're moving very fast. And so by having this tip swoop forward, we have the effective um, uh, impact of strikes at the tip are the same from a, from a survivability perspective as being, you know, having an interaction with the blade close to the hub. So those two things make the unique blade shape. And then once you have the blade shape, we can make it large or small. 
And that's the beauty, actually, last bit of it, is because we, if we think back to those two use cases, we want to upgrade the existing fleet, which does have quite a bit of large hydro in it. We want to make those plants, you know, operate for another 40 years with high efficiency and reliability, but we want to do that um, while passing fish safely now. And we also want to unlock new build in places where there's a lot of potential for growth. And we want that new build to start from the beginning being um, uh, supportive of biodiversity outcomes in rivers. Does the technology scale from, say, a, a small turbine set to you know some of the massive ones like at uh, Hoover, Grand Coulee, or, or, or something like that, and high head, low head, and flow rates, and, and, and all of that stuff that I'm sure you have to, to consider when you're designing a, a dam, a small one or a big one? Yeah, great question. So the uh, answer is we can scale any size of turbine. So whether we're talking um, turbines that are you know three feet in diameter, six feet in diameter, or seven feet in diameter, eight feet, like there, there's a wide range of um, of sizing that is completely scalable. Um, the constraint that we do have right now is we can go up to about 125 feet of head. Um, okay. Above that what's called pressure effects or barotrauma become more um, of the driving issue as opposed to strike. And so other things take over in terms of, you know, how you can design, like how you can best design for fish safety. And it becomes a harder problem to solve, just to be blunt. Um, about to put some numbers on it, about half, just under half of the existing installed base of the United States is under 125 feet of head. Okay. And so, um, we, you know, we look at it and say, okay, we can take half the U.S. fleet, upgrade it. So it goes, you know, to basically passing fish with near 100% survival rates. And that, if we can do that, you know, with upgrading, modernizing the fleet, um, you know, get another five to 15% of energy out of these existing assets that are already connected to the grid and now pass fish at near hundred percent survival. That's a really good thing overall. How many dams are concerned with, uh, fish survivability or actually passing fish, right? If I think about Hoover Dam, are they really concerned about fish migrating, uh, through the Colorado river or, or what have you? And does that one even then come into, to, to play here? is probably less so uh yeah hoover is probably a different little bit of a different case and also probably a little bit higher in head um i don't think so right now right (laughs) i think it's way down but certainly on the east or sorry on the east coast where there's a lot of focus right now we have um a ton of hydro all up and down the eastern half of the u.s um a lot of hydro opportunities in the midwest as well um, on the U- on the eastern side, uh, we're really looking at eel and herring. Um, so in particular, eel are a species of concern um, where they migrate upstream as small as babies and they come back downstream as quite large um, fish and uh, unfortunately don't interact well with, again, a lot of existing hydro. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, and the reason for eel, the interest around eel is that is actually like what's crystallizing the interest specifically around eel is that is actually water quality. So eel are a particular, um, they are as a species, they transport a type, some, a type of mollusks in their gills as they migrate. And those mollusks are really critical to then help maintain water quality. Um, and so as eel populations have declined, the, density of these species of mollusks, which help maintain water quality in the rivers where they're found, are also decreasing. And so in the context of actually improving water quality, the goal is to actually then support eel populations because we all benefit from cleaner water. Um, On the West Coast, the species of concern is salmon. And there, of course, there's a commercial fishery that's, you know, substantially at risk um, because of, uh, of a number of impacts to the salmon population. In Europe, it, the species are tend to be eel, salmon, herring. Um, so basically the, the answer is it depends where you are. Um, in places, uh, in some more developing country areas, the, it's not as much a mandated regulatory requirement around fish passage, but, uh, but instead more so driven by the fact that in many places, um, fish are an important part of the human food chain mm-hmm. um, and food security for for you know local populations. And so, again, maintaining um, maintaining fish and fish stocks is a critical element of just supporting um, local food security. 
I was uh, watching some of the the YouTube videos on some of the research you were doing about uh, salmon in particular. You know, going through the through the turbine that was done uh, right right near us and at uh, Pacific Northwest Labs. I think was some of the the, the folks helping yep. you out with that. Um, just just about mm, twenty miles south of us, there's Lower Granite Dam, and it's it's under it's one of four that's being considered for. Or, Actively considered being taken out, right, for salmon recovery, and I'm I'm, I'm certainly a huge fan of uh, hydroelectric power, especially these days when you know the the grid is a little bit unstable with all the the solar and wind being put into the system, and when the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow, right, it's certainly nice to have a reliable generation source. So this this sounds like uh, very encouraging stuff for uh, for uh, existing. Um, dams and maybe, maybe this can help. You know, the, 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 obviously for us, the, the big thing is the salmon impact, and that's that's the real motivator for for pulling out those dams. So we can come up with solutions where we can, you know, um, help with the salmon runs and still have reliable power. I'm, I am certainly all for it. I think a lot of your your discussion about the turbine blade was for the. I think you guys refer to it as the downstream migration of of the salmon. Do you guys have any technology that can help us when they're swimming up the river? Um, <laughs> not directly in a the reverse turbine. turbine or something. Yeah, Maybe we do turbine, that. Yeah, a Push pump. Yeah. Um, the uh, so the no, our focus is downstream passage. Um, upstream passage though is is very species specific. So salmon, for example, are very energetic swimmers, and actually, like upstream passage is a, is a getting salmon upstream is is something that we're actually quite good at. Like at this point, with the ladders reasonable. and everything. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, it's the bigger issue is actually getting smolts downstream safely in large numbers. That's actually the more, the more challenging part of the, of the process. Now, um, when it comes to eel, eel, when they migrate upstream are actually, again, very amenable, like they're good. They're very, actually very good, very cheap ways to get, um, eel upstream. It's coming downstream that they unfortunately just have a very hard time of it. River herring are pretty fragile fish. Um, again, you can get, in general, we have ways to get fish upstream. Um, I think some of the work we're doing around more what we call restoration hydro, which moves outside of just the turbine solution, but instead now looks at some of the work we're doing, uh, like some of the work that's happening around dam removals, actually, around river restoration, um, are, are really focused around saying, okay, how can we learn from um, techniques that are, that you already see in natural rivers, um, that we're using in river restoration and incorporate those into, um, changes to hydropower, either new plants or existing plants to incorporate more natural like fish ways, like more natural, naturalistic ways to accommodate, uh, to accommodate and encourage upstream, um, and downstream passage. Uh, and so I think there's some interesting opportunities there as well. Those in in truth, I think those become easier to deploy when you're talking about new build, um, when you're just you know starting from from designing a project from scratch. Um, that you can we now know a lot more about how to design from the start in ways that will help maintain um, and support river connectivity. Um, and then for projects where we are, we we definitely think that there are some opportunities where projects that you might look at for a full dam removal actually could be reconfigured in ways that enable more connectivity, but still maintain power production. Um, and that's an area which we think there's some really interesting opportunities as well through this kind of restoration hydro type approach. Are there, maybe, and maybe you know these statistics, is there, are there statistics like, uh, for, let's use salmon because they're, they're close to us and that's what I'm thinking of right now. A, 10 salmon swim up the river, are nine going to make it past the dam? And if you know, there's salmon coming down the river. Is it, you know, with the traditional uh, uh, hydro turbine, is it uh, four out of 10 don't make it through the, the turbine? Are, are there some some statistics like that that you could share with us? Yeah. So, the, I mean, broadly speaking, something like one in five, about 20 percent of fish on average across like all hydro don't make it. OK, um, that's going down. Uh, yeah. Downstream. OK. Yeah. 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 Um, and then different species have worse, different species and different turbine types or different types of projects have worse passage rates. Like we, you know, there definitely are passage rates that are, uh, you know, unfortunately get into like 30, 40, 50, like they're, half, unfortunately, half don't make it. Yeah. There are some, you know, maybe, but, but the average number, um, you know, where there's some good research supporting it is about one in five. Okay. That's interesting.
it's unfortunately, you know, part of the reason, again, it's another statistic is just that since about 1970, we've seen something like a 70% decline in freshwater biodiversity. Um, that is obviously not all due to hydropower, right? There's a lot of things that have changed in our river systems, but it's a, you know, hydro is definitely a contributor. Oh, to sure. That. Sure. Last year, you announced a partnership with the U.S. energy investor and developer Symbian Power to bring reliable, low-cost electricity to the Democratic Republic of Congo. This work includes 33 projects. Will you describe the work you are doing in DRC and tell us how's it going? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're quite excited about this partnership. Um, so Symbian is a you know, project developer. They have built projects across Africa um, and the Middle East over the last couple decades. Um, prior to this effort in hydro, they had focused mostly in gas and a bit in geothermal. Um, the hydro-specific approach in um, the uh, DRC is because the DRC has a ton of hydro, something like a hundred gigawatts of hydro resource potential, of which less than a percentage is 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 utilized at this point. They've got a massive resource, um, and so uh, yeah, the Symbian screened something like 60, 65 projects at this point, down selected to thirty three. First project is signed and should go start start construction later this year. Um, they expect or are working to have that first project online and producing power next year and then roll out the rest um, after that. So now the rollout, I don't yet know the full timeline. It will take, you know, I, I think we want to see the first project. They, We all want to see this first project start construction, shovel in the ground and, and then go forward. At this point, it has all of the necessary project approvals. It's waiting for one last approval on a transmission line um, portion that needs to be built. And so once that's in, then they'll go shovels in the ground and, and actually commence the work. How, how big are these generators you're putting in over there? Uh, this first project's four and a half megawatts. Uh, next okay. project looks like it's an eight megawatt, uh, will be an eight megawatt plant. Uh, yeah, so we're talking, you know, these are these are good you know, they're, they're small, yeah. um, particularly for hydro, they're small, uh, but uh, but they're sizable from a um, contribution to the grid. It's great to learn about the work you and the Natel team are doing today. What's next? And is there other innovations in hydropower outside of Natel or in other parts of the world that you are excited about? There's some really great work uh, being done by other um, folks in the hydro space with respect to um, improving um, and modernizing turbine um, hydropower in general. So uh, work to optimize controls and dispatch. One of the big things that's changed in um, in hydro and the way hydro is operated as a result of, of more intermittent renewables on the grid is that in the past, hydro was kind of very much this classic baseload resource. Um, but what we're really seeing is that hydro is now being called upon to dispatch very actively. And actually, if you look um, for example, last summer in any ISO in the U.S. where you have hydro and natural gas and wind and solar, what you'll see is basically gas and hydro dispatch profiles intraday are like matched because it's gas and hydro are the two flexible resources that are basically um, dispatching minute by minute, hour by hour to balance. And there, there's a nuance to that that is, um, I think, just really critical to understand because to get to maintain a reliable grid is not, you know, it's not just batteries. It's not just storage. It's, it's that ability for the power systems operators to actually like, you know, dispatch resources minute by minute, hour by hour, right. To maintain the grid signal, grid frequency, right. Uh, within a very narrow band. Um, and to do that, there's just this whole different way to dispatch um, and control hydro and some really great innovation that is being done across um, across renewable energy broadly that also is being applied in hydro. That's super exciting. There's some really cool work to hybridize hydro with batteries directly, again, in the view that like um, finding ways to to leverage the innovations around battery technology to help, you know, make the combined resource that much more beneficial for delivering the reliability services that the grid needs in certain areas. There's some folks doing some cool work for fish passage as well, like, or just overall, um, uh, improvement on the environmental side, including fish passage, including dissolved oxygen. So finding ways to have um, uh, turbines that can oxygen, oxygenate the water that passes through them. Um, that's really exciting. The, the interesting rethink that the whole industry is going through is 
one where I, that I think will spark more innovation as we go forward is just simply the fact that to, to do, to say, to kind of frame it in two ways, climate change is water change. Like the change in climate, what we're seeing in climate change, we, we feel in, in not just, of course, temperatures, but changing water patterns. And, um, there's a climate scientist who gives the analogy that if climate change were a shark, well, then water is the teeth. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and so, um, and I think that presents this really interesting opportunity for hydro because all hydro projects are water projects and, um, finding ways to improve our understanding of how to utilize hydropower projects to manage a more volatile water cycle, I think is really cool. And, uh, and there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, one of our sister, uh, sister company that we work with a lot <laughs> called Upstream Tech has developed this amazing technology that takes machine learning and satellite imagery and weather forecasts and puts all of that together into a more accurate flow forecast, for example. And again, that's something which we think has, well, is already frankly demonstrating some very good value of just, you know, better day to day, season to season operations for hydro plants, but I think over time can generate some useful insights as well as we think about how we need to invest in this existing infrastructure to upgrade it for those water challenges ahead. Do you, uh, do you think we'll be building, uh, more, more dams and, and hence, you know, more, more water retention, more, more, uh, electric generation. You go look at, uh, say, uh, Southern California or California at, at, at large in Nevada, right? They had the biggest snowpack they've had in years and years and years. And I, I bet, 90% of that all washed out into the ocean at the uh, come, come this spring or certainly a, a good portion of it anyway. And uh, if we'd had some some more water retention, if you will, right, not only could we we save that water for all kinds of irrigation and, and, and what have you, but also for generating power too. Yeah. And I think that you touch on another place, another point, kind of that extension of, of exactly a place where I think there's some real innovation, not just in building new kind of traditional water storage, but also to leverage the fact that we have a much deeper understanding today than we did 10, 20, 30 years ago about how um, combining what we think of as maybe gray or classic, you know, concrete civil engineering with green, you know, natural infrastructure approaches can actually help um, do exactly that. So for example, finding ways maybe to have more like naturalistic type retention, maybe even like beavers and beaver ponds in upper watersheds, right? That helps slow that runoff down, help get, you know, water into the ground because the reality is that groundwater storage is a storage resource that is two to three orders of magnitude larger than surface storage. Like we will never build the same surface storage that we have underground. And so finding ways to get water into the ground is a is a super way to basically improve water availability year round because streams that run year round are, are streams and rivers that have connectivity to groundwater where the groundwater storage is robust. Um, and, and that is a critical thing. And there's again, a lot of research that's been done to help really demonstrate that reperennialization. So, so taking streams that were going dry every year, building or reintroducing beaver um, in a lot of these cases just, you know, simply led to reperennialization. So you took a stream that would go dry every summer to a stream that's now running year round simply because you have groundwater recharge occurring because of these very simple civil structures effectively um, that are helping to drive groundwater recharge. Just an example, it's, it's not, you know, it's not going to work in all situations and all, you know, geologies, but, um, but I think something that's pretty, is just an example that we're pretty excited about. It was uh, interesting. I think I saw on your on your website that uh, ranchers were taking out beaver dams because they they, they thought it was going to mess up their grazing fields or or what have you, and actually did the opposite. Right? It was great to have the beavers there. Not only did they make nice meadows and stuff when the the, the water backed up a little bit, but they were recharging the aquifer at the same time. So it's uh, yeah. they don't have to be very big, right, to have a big impact. A lot of little ones probably is a good thing. Yeah, and particularly in upper upper watersheds, absolutely. And and then I think you know as you get down to lower watersheds and things that are closer to you know larger human um, you know places where more people live, basically, uh, you can think about finding ways to you know mimic uh, with more gray infrastructure some of the similar things that you you know get in different places with natural infrastructure. Um, but yeah, that's interesting. All right, uh, if I could have you forecast out thirty or fifty years. 
What do you see as the, the future for hydroelectric power? Um, I think that we have a very unique opportunity here over the next 10 to 15 years to really fundamentally transform the industry um, into one that is is you know seeing good growth, so new gigawatts added every year, um, and where as a infrastructure class, it becomes a unique infrastructure class that's contributing to both um, mitigating climate change, so reducing emissions and improving river sustainability uh, from a biodiversity perspective, and helping to manage the adaptation to climate change that we inevitably are doing and are going to have to continue to do with changing water patterns. And so I, I see a bright future for hydro looking forward 30 to 50 years. I think that we're going to navigate quite a few challenges along the way, but I think those challenges are, are just due simply to the, the overall challenge that we face of how do we, how do we evolve and an overall economy, frankly, not just an energy infrastructure, um, in a way that is grounded in reliable, low cost, sustainable electricity. But overall, very excited. <laughs> I, I, I am, I am with you. Out of, out of all our energy sources, I think I, I'm a big, big fan of hydro. It's, uh, it's clean, it's green, and if we can do the the bio, fix, fix all the the challenges with the the salmon or the eels or or the other fishes. Um, it, it's, it's a win-win for everybody. You know, we don't, we don't measure these big batteries in, in hours, right? They are days and <laughs> months and almost years. So it's, it's, it's a great, uh, electrical resource. So Gia, thank you very much for coming on Schweitzer Drive. Really appreciate your time and your insight. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you for stopping by Schweitzer Drive. Join us again as we learn about, explore, and celebrate electric power. For more information about the show, please visit selinc.com slash Schweitzer Drive.